Y'all ready to get into the Word? Let's welcome our television audience this morning. Praise the Lord! We're glad you could be with us today. I encourage you to go and get your Bible and follow along with us. Get a hold of your Bibles this morning. Let's lift them up to heaven and make a good confession with me. Say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can have what it says I can have. I can do what it says I can do. This morning I'll be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I will never be the same again. In Jesus' name. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Go with me to the book of Matthew in chapter 16. I kind of let it out already this morning. The, the name of my sermon is going to be The Silence of the Lamb. Now there was a movie in 1991 called The Silence of the Lambs. Plural. And, and this movie was a phenomenon. I mean, it, it, it won almost all the awards. Y'all realize that? I wonder why the world was so intrigued. I think it had a little bit to do with the, with the title. You know? And uh, I, I, I did a little research on this. They spent $19 million to make that movie. But it brought in $272 million worldwide. Sounded like they sowed and reaped. Didn't it? Now, it was a dark movie. It was about a serial killer. It was kind of a dark movie. But, but there, this, this title is all I'm really want you to look at. But you know what happened? It won, uh, let me see where I have this written down. It won the best actor, best actress, best director, best picture, and best screenplay at the Academy Awards. But these were just fake actors getting paid money, putting on makeup, you know, it's just like the Passion of the Christ. That was, that was an actor acting. But about 2,000 years ago, there was a screenplay that was played out before the whole world. And it wasn't an actor that was acting. His name was Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who went to the cross for you and me. But do you realize that there was a screenplay written before Jesus ever got here? That the Word of God, all the way from the beginning, all the way through, talks about what Jesus Christ was going to do. Amen. So when He got here, it was already written. And so when He would talk to His people that He came to, He says He came to His own, and His own didn't receive them, receive Him. He would tell them they should have known it was Jesus because they should have read the screenplay. You know, some people are worried about the Antichrist whenever he's going to come. If you read the screenplay, you're going to recognize Christ and you're going to recognize Antichrist. Amen. You're not going to be deceived. We need to be reading our Bibles, my friends, and not just listening to religious people teach us. We need to read our Bibles. And I say that, but most people, they don't really read their Bibles. They listen to teachings. They come to church every now and then. When it's convenient and nothing else is going on, it's not open season, it's not, you know, a football game, a basketball game, everything. If everything is just right, some of y'all just make it to church to do God a little favor. Well, thank you for coming. Come on. You need to read the screenplay. You need to read the Word of God. Every day you should be picking up this word and reading it. And if you'll read it, the Holy Spirit will illuminate it and bring it to life. And when you listen to me or listen to someone else preach or, or go and get involved in what God's called you to do, you're going to hear Jesus. You're going you're to sense the Holy Spirit. You're going to have something to give to somebody else because you're equipping yourself with the word of God. We need to get into the word. This is life right here. Now, 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 this is Scripture. Say Scripture. Scripture. Now, the Scripture is the written Word of God. Now, when that Scripture is read and listened to, the life of God comes into it and it illuminates our heart. It brings us revelation knowledge. It begins to reveal to us Jesus Christ. That's what this Word does. And when we see Jesus, then it begins to reveal to us who we really are. You don't know who you are if you don't know Jesus Christ. That's simple. You have no idea who you are. You don't understand what love is until you receive the love of God through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That's where love is seen, in the giving of one's life for us. 
He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. In Matthew chapter 16, look with me at verse 24. Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me. Anybody here wants to go after Jesus? That's why I'm here. I'm after Christ. I'm following him. I'm not just here because it's a little religious activity this morning. I want Jesus Christ. You need Jesus Christ. And if anyone wants him, if anyone comes after me, this is red letter. Let him deny himself. Say deny himself. Turn to your neighbor. Say deny yourself. Okay, so when you want that second dessert, deny yourself. Amen? Glory to God. When your car runs good, but you want another car, deny yourself and maybe sow some things into building the kingdom instead of just your kingdom. Now see, this is reality, guys. This is reality, what we're talking about here. The truth is, as Americans, we don't deny ourselves anything. When you go get your happy meal and they say, do you want to supersize it? Some of y'all don't deny yourselves. Y'all just, just supersize that thing. I'm going to get my money's worth. See, your, your problem isn't gluttony. Your problem is the love of money. See, when you go to the buffet, it's like, I'm going to get my money's worth out of that buffet. And you walk out like, oh, oh. We don't deny ourselves. I see we're hitting home now. And every time I preach this, everybody goes to the buffet after church. Last time I talked about the buffet, somebody came back and said, half the church was at the Chinese buffet. We don't like to deny ourselves, do we? But if you don't learn to deny yourself, you'll never be free. If you don't learn to deny your flesh, that, that debased nature, you'll never be free because it will control your life. Amen? Amen? If you want to overcome smoking cigarettes, you're going to have to learn to deny yourself. Amen. Alcohol, you've got to deny yourself. Amen. Drugs, you've got to deny yourself. Amen. You know when you're struggling with these things? I, whenever you slip and you fall, you feel bad after, don't you? Whenever you, whenever you want to get rich quick and you want to go gambling, you got to what? Deny yourself. Because after you go and lose your money, you feel bad about it. Isn't it. Wouldn't it be awesome if we could feel bad about it before we do it? But we're, we're not like a dog. We actually have reason. We have common sense in us. We, we shouldn't be led by our animal nature. You can think about what happened last time you did it and not do it the next time. Amen. By the grace of God, you surrender that to God and you say, you know what? I am going to deny myself. And what does he say? Take up his cross and follow me. Say his cross. His cross. You know, Jesus wasn't talking about Jesus' cross. Jesus said, you have a cross that you have to carry if you're going to be my disciple. But the church doesn't want to carry a cross. We want a crossless Christianity is what we want. And I've been teaching on leadership, and this is a leadership teaching. Do you realize, you say, well, why are you teaching on leadership? We're just regular people. That's where you're wrong. Every person in this room is a leader. God's created you to be a leader. You've got to change your mind. But there's a cost to walking in leadership. There's a cost to walking in victory. There's a cost to walking in the kingdom of God. And the cost is you have to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Him. you got to love Him more than anything else. More than father and mother, the Bible says. you got to love Him more. Amen. He's got to be first. He needs to be your first love. In another place, when Jesus is talking about the cost of discipleship, He says no one's going to build a building unless He first sits down and counts the cost that He's able to finish. Whenever you're fixing to get up and give your life to Jesus Christ, you need to understand to walk with Jesus is going to cost you the denial of yourself and there's going to be a cross that you need to bear. It's not everything is going to be, uh, you know, rosy 
Whenever you come up here, God's just going to take his little wand and touch every circumstance in your life and you're not going to have any more problems. How many of y'all know that the storms still come? In fact, there's some storms get kicked up because you start walking with Jesus. See, when you're not a threat to the kingdom of darkness, he's leaving you alone. When you get a hold of the covenant of Jesus Christ and you're washed in the blood and the word of God's getting sown into your life, the devil's job is to come and try to steal that out of your heart. The world's job is to come and, and choke out what God's doing. You know that if you love the world, the Bible says that you are an enemy of God. So those of you that are sitting here today and you love the world, you are God's enemy. And that means you're my enemy. If you love the world. How can we love the world that crucified him? If he is truly our Lord and our Savior, the passion of our lives. The one in whom we say we love. The one in whom we worship. But see, we don't deny ourselves. We still get up and we go back and we backslide into the world. Say backslide. backslide. Y'all okay this morning? I didn't come to tickle your ears this morning. Because a lot of people come through church, but a lot of people don't get where they stay. Stay in the covenant with God. Because they don't deny themselves. They haven't been taught that part of this walking with God, the cost is denying oneself. Amen. Now how do we learn how to do that? In the Word. Listen, I, I want to talk to you about the silence of the Lamb. Because we need to learn that whenever things are going wrong in our lives, sometimes we just need to shut up. Amen. How many hours did Jesus stay on the cross? The, they say six hours He was on the cross. Say six hours. In the six hours time that he was on the cross, he said seven things. Do y'all realize that? He only said seven things while he was on the cross. And I can say all seven things in less than a minute. So that leaves five hours and 59 minutes of silence. He was silent on the cross way more than he said anything. And when we have to take up our crosses, we need to learn how to say only what he said when he had to endure his cross and be quiet the rest of the time. Oh, I, I, somebody needs to hear this. I know you might not think so, but listen. Listen to what he said. He, here's what he said. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's Luke 23, verse 34. The second thing he said, he says, As surely I say to you, he says this to the thief, Today you will be with me in paradise. He looks at John and he says, and, and his mother, he says, woman, behold your son. Then he says, behold your mother. Then he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then fifth, he says, I thirst. Then he says, it is finished. And he says, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. That's it. The rest of the time he was quiet. And they were, they were spitting at him, beating him, taunting him. And his blood was just being poured out. The two thieves on each side, they were, they were uh, reviling him. But then one of them saw something. Not in what Jesus said. I believe that he saw something in what Jesus didn't say. And then when he did hear him speak, listen to the type words he speaks when he speaks from the, the, the place where men were torturing him, where they were spitting on him, where he came to his own and his own didn't receive him. You think you're having a bad day? You think you have a right to complain? He had a right to complain. Didn't he? But he's on the cross and listen to the silence. He's just quiet. They said, if you are the Son of God, if you're the Messiah, come down off that cross. Aren't you glad He didn't come down off the cross? Aren't you glad He stayed on that cross for you and for me? Aren't you glad He didn't just call and say, uh, Father, save me off of this cross. It says He could have called for a legion of angels and they would have came and taken Him. But He didn't. He remained there for you and me. He stayed there. Isn't that awesome? Listen to these words again. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. 
When people are hurting you and, and coming against you and torturing you, I mean, they were killing him. They were nailing nails into his hands, nails into his feet, onto a, a, a cross, a tree, nailing him up, the Son of God, the innocent Lamb of God, the perfect Lamb of God. Beating him, putting crowns, sticking it into his, his head. Spitting on him. Gambling his, his clothes away. But what does he say? To those that are persecuting him and, and reviling him, he says, Father, forgive them. For they do not know what they do. So he... he this is how we're supposed to respond to the people in our lives that are hurting us. He shows us. Because when they're hurting you, you need to understand it's a cross. Amen. It's part of what God has planned for you. Amen? And you need to respond like Jesus did with your cross. He's not asking you to do one thing He wouldn't do Himself. Amen. He did it for us to show us how to do it. Then he looked at what would seemingly be the undeserving, mocking him, criminals, felons on the left and on the right. And what does he do? Y'all deserve to go to hell. Nope, he doesn't curse him. When that one finally sees him and recognizes him, he recognizes that he recognizes him and he turns to him and he says, Surely I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now this is an awesome thing. This criminal is going to be the first one with Jesus Christ in heaven. Isn't that amazing? So no matter where you are today, you need to realize that if you will recognize who Jesus is today, say today, today, today He will save you. Today He will change you. He'll bring you out of that, that mess and say, there's a kingdom here for you. Then He turns to His family, His mom. He's taking care of business, isn't he? And he says, woman, he didn't call her mother. Through the scripture, Jesus always called his mother woman. You need to read it yourself. Find out yourself. He says, woman, behold your son, pointing to John. Then he says to John, behold your mother. So carrying your cross, you need to realize the priorities of your life. You need to take care of your family. No matter what this cross is bringing in your life, you still should be taking care of your family. Come on. Whenever the cross comes, it's not time to throw away your wife or your husband. It's time to, to stay, to endure. Amen? It's a cross. How are you going to respond? Mermen complaining, gossiping about him, talking about him. Oh, no, that's not how Jesus did it. He remained quiet for five hours and 59 minutes. Then he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So now he's addressing God. Any of y'all ever feel like God's nowhere around? Oh, I feel like that at times. But I know I don't need a feeling because he's promised me he would never leave me nor forsake me. He will be with me. But you know, Jesus lets us know whenever you're bearing your cross, it feels like God's nowhere around. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then we want to blame God. See, if we would just stop there, we'd be good. But we don't say, why have you forsaken me? You said, da, 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 da. And you wouldn't do this. And now I've got all this. Why me? Why, oh, why me, God? No, see, you're going too far. You need to say what Jesus said and then be quiet for the rest of the sermon. See, what Jesus did when he was on the cross in his silence was way more than what, you, what he did with his words. He was very careful with what he said. Then he says, he says, I thirst. It's like, I still haven't found the satisfaction I need. I'm still thirsty. There, that humanity, there, there's still this part of me that, that still feels like I need more. And he, he wants you to understand that he understood that. He understood that. He was up there bleeding, nailed, beaten, whipped on his back, blood flowing. And he was thirsty. No one was taking care of him. He was bearing his cross. So he addresses his physical need. Then he says, it is finished. To me, that's when he addressed all of eternity. 
past, present, and future. God the Father, the devil, ever, you and me. He said, it is finished. I have completed my task. I have now paid the debt that was paid for every human being. It is finished. And believe me, it was not to be continued. It was, it is finished. Then he talks to his father, trusting. Listen to this. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. You know, when you're getting born again, that's what you're doing. You're actually coming to God and saying, God, into your hands I commit my spirit. I'm giving my life. I'm trusting you. I'm giving my life to you. The disciples did not understand what was taking place. Jesus many times tried to tell them, I'm going to go to the cross. Look with me if you're still there in Matthew chapter 16. Look with me at verse 16 where Simon Peter answered him whenever he said, Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered in verse 16 said, You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him and said, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Do you know that if you know that Jesus is the Messiah, it's because God has opened your eyes and you need to give God praise because He's allowed you to see God, to see Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God? And He says in verse 18, And I also say to you that you are Peter. Now His name was Cephas. One swayed with the wind. His name meant one that would be bent easy. But then Jesus changes his name. He says, you are Peter, rock. Say rock. And then he says, and upon this rock, different word there. The second word rock means massive rock. That rock is Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ is the rock that you build your life on. And when God reveals to you what Jesus did for you on the cross, and you receive that, that's when you're born again, and your life changes. You're no longer swayed by everything going on in this world. You have a foundation that you can build your life upon, Jesus Christ. And when the crosses of life come, He's going to say, this is how you're supposed to respond to it. You've got to deny yourself, take up the cross, and follow me. Now, now, Peter's got this revelation. He says, And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That's an awesome thing. It, this revelation of Jesus Christ, and now you're walking in authority. You've got the keys of the kingdom. There's power in your life. Verse 20, Then he, Jesus, commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. He, he said, now, now that you know who I am, let me tell you what's really going to happen now. He says, I'm fixing to go to Jerusalem and the religious people, the scribes and the Pharisees and the scribes, they're going to get a hold of me. And I'm going to suffer at their hands and they're going to kill me. And I'm going to be raised from the dead. But they did not understand. They still did not understand what Jesus was saying. And what does Peter say to him? Right after that, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Can you imagine rebuking Jesus? Now, now, now Peter, he just said, he said to Peter, you're a rock. Peter, you got the revelation. You know who I am. And Jesus said, now that y'all know who I am, now you, you should have read the screenplay back there. Isaiah writes about the cross so clear. I'd like to take us there this morning, maybe for a couple of minutes. And so he's fulfilling what is written about him right before their eyes. But Peter says, no cross, Jesus. We don't want any cross. You don't need a cross. What do you think the devil said to him when he was tempted in the wilderness? He said, if you'll throw yourself down from here, they're going to see. You know, the, the angel will bear you up. F fall down and worship me and I'm going to give you all these things. There's a way to get all this without the cross. But Jesus said, no, there's not. Worshiping God also means taking up the cross and following him. Whatever you have as a Christian that has not been brought to you by the cross or your own cross is going to be tested by the 
a cross in your life. And if it's not real, you will backslide and fall away. But if you know how to respond when the cross comes to your life, when the trial comes to your life, Whenever you're abused and misused and things go wrong in your life, when you know how to deny yourself, take up this cross and follow Jesus, then you're going to see victory come into your life. But we need to be willing to deny ourselves. But Peter pulls him aside and rebukes him and says, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall not happen to you. Far be it, Lord. You, we, we're not going to let you die. What does Jesus say to Peter. He turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. He turns to Peter. He calls him Satan. He didn't say, Satan, get out of Peter. He, he looked right at Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. And what does he say? Because you're not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. The way man says it is, You come to God, everything's going to be all right. You're not going to have any problems. You're not going to have any crosses in your life. Everything's going to be hunky-dory. Get behind me, Satan. If there's a cross in my future for the glory of God, I'm going to deny myself, take up my cross, and follow Him. Amen. And whenever these things come and people mistreat you, you should say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When you see a felon, someone that's done something wrong, a criminal, and they finally turn to Jesus, you can look at them and say, you're saved. God has transformed your life. Today, you have become a child of God. You are a son and a daughter of God. Amen? How do we respond? Oh, yes, things, things seem dry. Things, things seem to be out of whack. I thirst. Okay, he heard you. Take up your cross. But we like murmuring and complaining. We like to blame everybody else for our problems. Amen? We've got to quit blaming everybody else. Praise God. Listen, y'all want to know one of the most powering things you can do in your life? Y'all want some power? Y'all want some power today? Y'all think it's just going to float out of heaven on you? Let me tell you what's going to give you power today. If every one of y'all here today take 100% responsibility for your own life. No more blaming mama. No more blaming the abuse of your past. No more blaming daddy. No more blaming husband and wife and children. You take 100% responsibility for your life. 100%. That means your future is not in my hands. It's not in mom and daddy's hands. It's not in the world's hands. It's not in the devil's hands. It's in your hands. And when you submit to God, you will have victory to walk this thing out. Listen, this works, people. This really works. You know, you're three years old in the Lord. I mean, three weeks old. Sarah, I'm 21 years old in the Lord. I started just where you are. But God has continued to work in me because I begin to work with God. Now, I don't know if y'all get this. When you take 100% responsibility, that means you have total control over your destiny. Amen? Amen? 